This episode is brought to you by Amazon Prime. From streaming to shopping, Prime helps you get more out of your passions. So whether you're a fan of true crime or prefer a nail-biting novel from time to time, with services like Prime Video, Amazon Music, and fast free delivery, Prime makes it easy to get more out of whatever you're into or getting into. Visit Amazon.com slash Prime to learn more. This podcast is supported by FX's English Teacher, a new comedy from executive producers of What We Do in the Shadows and Baskets. English Teacher follows Evan, a teacher in Austin, Texas, who learns if it's really possible to be your full self at your job while often finding himself at the intersection of the personal, professional, and political aspects of working at a high school. FX's English Teacher premieres September 2nd on FX. Stream on Hulu. Oh man, so He-Man and the Masters of the Universe movie. What went wrong with this movie aside from almost everything? You know, 80s was a massive time for He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. It had a hugely successful cartoon franchise. It had an even more successful toy line. So naturally, the next step would be a movie. They cast Dolph Lundgren. He looked like He-Man. He he acted like He-Man. He was jacked like He-Man. He was He-Man. They couldn't have gotten a better casting for He-Man than than Dolph Lundgren. So what went wrong? The movie comes out and they didn't give what was promised. The movie was called He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, but it was not what kids in in the audience knew. It wasn't the characters for the most part from the TV show. Sure, there was a, a sort of version of Skeletor. There was sort of a version of Prince Adam. But where was Orko? Where's Man at Arms? Where's all these characters that these kids grew up with and, and played with and watched every week and every day? They were nowhere to be found. Instead, you got uh, some weird troll thing um, that was He-Man's buddy. Like, what is this? Like, Kids would go to the theater to see this movie so excited, like it was going to be life-changing, and they didn't get what they knew from their everyday life. They got something else. Where was Eternia? They weren't on Eternia. They were on Earth. He-Man doesn't take place on Earth. It take, or, or in the States or whatever the hell they were. It takes place in Eternia. And they weren't there. They Nothing was there. This wasn't what kids grew up watching and playing with. It was a false advertised movie. It was, it was a pile of crap is what it was. I hope they do better with this next one. I don't. I, I have my doubts that they will, based on who they cast. But uh, basically, He Man and the Masters of the Universe false advertising because it was anything but He Man and the Masters of the Universe. Have fun ripping this one apart, boys. You know when I pick a movie, that's when I'm on to pressure now. The question always comes back to me: What were they thinking? And you know, Brendan, with that being said, uh, what do we always say on this podcast? We always say... Oh. <laughs> we just didn't have to do a podcast this week. Just let Josh's <laughs> intro rant for us for a bit. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I didn't like look at the running time before I started playing it. But I was like, this might be 90 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Josh, you saved us a lot of work. But and also some of the gripes, note for note. <laughs> yes, uh, we may be repeating some of those. Yeah, but uh, this is a podcast called "What Were They Thinking?" Mm-hmm. And I am Brendan, and I'm Nathan, and we're here to talk to continue this holiest of months, uh, listeners' choice month. We are talking about the 1987 classic. <laughs> masters of the universe not as josh said in the intro he-man and the masters of the universe they cut he-man out of the title but not the movie i don't know why don't ask <laughs> uh, it's not enough room to fit on a marquee love <laughs> ishiro i think what we needs to do here is cut the he-man pad because 
They're already the masters of the universe, and we're gonna call him He-Man throughout. So, just masters of the universe. Wait, this is based on something? <laughs> uh, some cartoon my nephew was telling me about. I don't really remember too much about it, uh, because I was taking a lot of Benadryl at the time. Okay, well just give me a second. I'm just, I'm just copying and pasting John Williams' career right now. That sounds like a good idea. End scene. <laughs> so, this movie... Oh boy, this is a movie <laughs> we've referenced many times. Yes. In fact, what a mini-sode a little while ago when we did the... <laughs> Postal. Uh, I had watched this movie as a palate cleanser <laughs> after watching Postal. So, still lets you know where we feel... About postal. Yeah, to be fair, I think. Uh, <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> to be fair. To be I fair. think uh, freestyle would be a palate cleanser for postal. Uh, well, <laughs> yes. Honestly, that is fair. <laughs> for, uh, but this movie. So the first thing I want to note is something I found out about this movie. Dolph Lundgren. I know it's very not apparent at all, but he barely spoke any English when they filmed this movie. So he yeah. is saying most of his lines phonetically. Which is fine. Which is fine, but I think it's funny. Uh, I was just going to actually give him a little bit of credit, because no, he's not great in this movie, or even good. But the fact that he's trying at least some type of acting while not knowing three quarters of what he's saying? Mm -hmm. Admirable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this movie, unfortunately, is uh, kind of a flop. And I think it's the biggest budget that Canon Films ever had. Yes, because they, the way they did their business model, I think I've touched on it before after I watched that documentary, uh, Electric Boogaloo, mm. the wild times of Canon Films. If, if I, I might have just butchered that title, but if you can find it, check it out. It's an amazing documentary on... A, a guerrilla filmmaking outfit trying to pass itself off as a major Hollywood studio. When you said that, I just uh, imagined an entire film outlet ran, run by gorillas. <laughs> I was like, those movies would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, uh, I think we'd probably have Montrose on a lot more if that was a legitimate <laughs> film studio. <laughs> Weirdly enough, they're not a fan of Gorillas in the Mist. Uh, well, well, it's, you know, whitewashing. Yeah, guerrilla <laughs> exploitation. So, anyhow, <laughs> Canon Films, uh, the way they ran their business model was that they would produce lower-budget, schlocky entertainment. Uh, Death Wishes and American Ninja. Uh, Ninja 3, The Domination... And surprisingly, those movies would just do crazy amounts of money for like relatively compared to the budget. Yeah, exactly. And then they would take that crazy amount of money that they made uh, off that and they would give a bigger budget to the next movie they were going to do and up and up and up and while continuing to make the lower stuff to feed the budgets for the bigger ones the mm -hmm. problem is is that they started getting licensed ips to produce yeah uh, like this and superman and it's, and they were gonna do spider-man yep they had the rights to spider-man that's yep. why it took so long for a spider-man movie to be made uh in the 90s they were going to make it with director albert pune the director of the 1990 <laughs> captain america so that lets you know where they were at. They were trying to start their own MCU long before it was cool. <laughs> oh my god, can you imagine? <laughs> Canon Films MCU. Good god, Endgame would have been so much different. <laughs> <laughs> Just somebody painted purple with a, with a Michael Jackson glove. <laughs> it probably would have had Michael Jackson in it. <laughs> I'm, I'm Thanos. I'm Thanos. Snap. <laughs> snap, snap. He's like, when we film this, do you mind if I snap more than once? It's kind of my thing. <laughs> uh. So, because of that, yes. uh, 
everybody had an expectation. I mean, there have already been three Superman movies, so you were expecting Richard Donner quality stuff if you ignored number three. Mm. Uh, also, there was a certain expectation for this movie because it should have been easy, lighthearted, kid-friendly, sword and sandals type stuff. Right. And they blew it. And yeah. because they blew it with this, and they blew it with Superman, they tanked super hard uh, because they made no money. And also, I believe Life Force was one of the ones that drained them of their Life Force, so to speak. Yep, yeah, yep. Because that movie, uh, while not critically hated as much as some of their other ones, it bombed hard. Yes. But this movie, yeah, so just to give you an idea, this movie cost $22 million, which doesn't seem like much now. In 1986 money. Yeah, 1986 money, $22 million, and it only made 17.3. So it was a pretty big, it was a pretty big flop. Yeah. Um, One thing I want to point out right off the bat, right from the top of the movie, is when I listened to the opening theme, it had been a while since I'd watched this as a child 30 times in a month. (laughs) No. <laughs> um, but I was listening to the opening theme song, and God, you know, Nathan, it sounded familiar. It did it not. I was expecting a certain man in blue tights and red cape to show up. Well, and I just want to like prove my point to the listeners because I put together a little clip, and this is just a little bit of the opening theme of this movie, followed by a little bit of the opening theme of another movie, and see if they sound slightly similar. Oh, Nathan, I apologize. I seem to have played the same clip twice. Superman and the Masters of the Universe. Yeah, it is like... I lo- I honestly, I was like, oh, maybe it's just the same composer. Nope. <laughs> Which, I mean, if they were going to do that, they could have actually m- made a movie version of the Superman and Masters of the Universe comic book crossover that happened. Uh, that sounds amazing. But if it's a... It would be awesome. But, yeah, right? but would it be as good as Superman 4 Quest for Peace? I, I feel that it would have no other alternative <laughs> but to be as good, if not better. I, did, I, ha- I didn't make a movie at all today, and that movie is as good as Superman 4. <laughs> I'd argue better. Uh, so my first note as we get started here, because when I watched this, uh, today, I think I, no, I think I definitely watched it once, sort of recently, but then before that, not since I was a child, so I just wrote, all right, childhood, prepare to be shattered. (laughs) My first note is, that is not Castle Grayskull. Uh, no, but it is a nice painting of a castle. It is. But they made no attempt to emulate or even just slightly resemble the building model for Castle Grayskull. And, spoiler alert, we get no nod, or we get one nod, sorry, but no look at Snake Mountain. (laughs) Not only that, but right after that Superman knockoff of a theme song, we go Mm -hmm. into a Star Wars ripoff. Yes. As the the clearly, like, stormtroopers wearing, like, Darth Vader helmets. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> and Skeletor, played by Frank Langella, who is the bright spot in this movie, I will say. Oh. He, he takes 
chicken shit and makes chicken salad. Which is hilarious because in the last time he appeared in a movie on this podcast, I thought he couldn't have looked less interested. <laughs> he was so bored. To be- <laughs> yes, brain scan... <laughs> It's more like brain drain. Am I right? <laughs> hey! But apparently, Frank Langella uh, didn't have to be asked twice to do this movie because he had a young son who loved He-Man, and he was like, yes, I'm 1,000% in. So in Frank Langella's mind, he is giving this thing 200%. He is in yeah. it to win it. The only problem is... Nobody else is? is? That, well, there's that. <laughs> but in regards to his... His performance and his dialogue, Skeletor never talked like any of this. No. There was so little evil cackling that I was upset. <laughs> he does have great, like, Shakespearean-esque monologues, though. Oh my, and delivered with so much heart. Like, oh, oh, this is, like, weird. He is the only... I'm not going to say only, but he is, like, a legitimate actor like he yeah. is bringing some fucking pedigree into this movie even in 1987 this dude mm-hmm. was lighting up the stage already like he was yeah. a big deal and that and the thing is he's definitely going on the ballot this year for trying to save this thing he may already be the winner <laughs> <laughs> heavy heavy favorite heavy favorite uh but we start out on the planet eternia at what is supposed to be castle gray skull Mm-hmm. With Skeletor, and uh, he's got the sorceress kidnapped. She does not look like the sorceress. <laughs> she, and basically, because he has the sorceress, uh, that allows him to slowly take over Castle Grayskull, which apparently gives you ultimate powers in the galaxy. And, yes. And so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, the sorceress, sorceress gets her own spotlight and fog machine, and... Uh, Skeletor is apparently projecting himself to the entire planet of Eternia via a canvas painting, because <laughs> that's apparently how we get we gotta we gotta use that twenty two million dollars carefully. <laughs> and that's Canon Films, man. It's they look they're hmm. <laughs> I love them so much and yet hate them all at the same time. <laughs> Well, here's the thing. I think if they're just doing one of their crazy bonkers original nutso pants movies, fine. Mm-hmm. But if they're going to take something that we know and love already, they, they don't True. have a good track record but that. <laughs> Very good. Yes, exactly. So because and and it's noted not only because of the the egregious amounts of matte paintings that they use, but when we get later into the parts where people are supposed to be flying, who boy. <laughs> oh, you mean the action figures, basically? Right. <laughs> I I am 90% sure that was just a He-Man Mattel doll. Yeah. On that little surfboard. I'm, I'm going to do my best right now. I want to get all my gripes with the nuanced stuff out of the way so we can dive into this. One, He-Man never wore a cape. Okay. There's several times in this movie where He-Man is... Blasting away with guns. Nope. That uh, even I even not as a He-Man cartoon fan, I knew that was wrong. Yeah, Men at Arms is in this movie, despite what Josh had said. However, he's never called Men at Arms. Is he? I thought he was at one I point. I don't. If he did, it was for a brief second. He didn't look like man at arms. They also very briefly mention that he is uh Tila's father like really which, quickly and then never go back to it. Right. That which leads dovetails quite nicely into my biggest complaint as a 9-year-old at that time and still today, that is not Tila's outfit. <laughs> I wanted more Princess Leia gold bikini cleavage when I was nine and when I'm now. Well, let me ask you this, though, Nathan, because I think... Yes. But but I believe the one thing they got right is that Courtney Cox was in the cartoon. Oh, my God. We'll get to that. <laughs> that is a whole other thing. I just wanted to address my nuanced stuff because if I didn't, we would tangent several times throughout the podcast. I really don't want to subject people to that. (laughs) (laughs) 
I don't want to know. It, it's not a Gamera episode, so I don't want to do that to everyone. It's the only time I find it acceptable is when explaining kaiju mythology to people. All right, well, let's get let's get kicking then. Okay. So we've got the sorceress kidnapped by Skeletor. He's telling everyone, I'm going to rule Castle Grayskull. You're all under my command. Meanwhile, we meet He-Man, played by Dolph Lundgren, a.k.a. Ivan Drago, which I think this was like right around that time. Yeah, this would have been maybe two years or a year after he did Rocky IV. Yeah, I think Rocky, yeah, Rocky IV is around like late, mid to late 80s. And like Josh said, this was some spot on physical casting. Yeah. No doubt. Oh, for sure. Uh, yeah, they couldn't have picked a, a more physical resemblance to He-Man. Yep. And given the dialogue that's in the movie and his stilted cadence of talking mm-hmm. actually kind of fit the He-Man character pretty well as well. Yeah. But let me ask you this, Brendan. Okay. Do we ever see uh, He-Man as Prince Adam? His secret alter ego? Nope. Fucking movie do we ever get to see battle cat or orco that's what i was gonna say we didn't see his dog thing battle cat oh well, whatever cat thing <laughs> what fucking mm. <laughs> you care about as much as the producers of this movie cared apparently it's... exactly i would have just been like hey where's the cat thing get the cat thing on set <laughs> uh, throw a saddle on it because <laughs> You know, he rode Battle Cat around. So, uh, in the meantime, yes, He-Man is, uh, finds a bunch, he, he fights a bunch of uh, Skeletor's uh, stormtroopers, let's just call mm-hmm. it what it is. He shoots them with guns, which, like Nathan said, big part of not being in the comic. Right. And Man-at-Arms and his daughter Tila make the save, and we meet the Jar Jar Binks of this movie, as far as I'm concerned, Gwildor. <laughs> I think he was supposed to be, like, the stand-in for Orko. Now, why not just have the right character? I don't know. Yeah, this... To describe Gwildor, I mean, I think he's kind of like... Yoda crossed with an Ewok crossed with the worst voice ever. He is, uh... Yoda, Ewok, Willow. The only thing... That could not have made those comparisons more clear is if they had gotten Warwick Davis to play him. <laughs> no, but instead we have legendary little person actor Billy Barty. Yep. Yep. So Billy Barty, or <laughs> Gwildor, explains that he <laughs> has... I'm already referring to him by the actor's name. He is a, a some sort of uh, inventor and locksmith. And he has created this thing he calls the Cosmic Key, which will allow you to jump to any place, I guess, in the galaxy? And time, apparently. Oh, yeah, well, we'll get into that. But apparently it also, uh, as characters tell us later in the movie, looks like a Japanese synthesizer. (laughs) Which I was like, hmm, okay. (laughs) Guess I'll have to accept (laughs) that and move on. (laughs) But Gwildor basically is like, well, they tried to kidnap me because Skeletor wants this Cosmic Key because he's going to basically rule everywhere not just eternia yes he wants all the power in the universe yeah so the get they're like all right gwildor we trust you i guess even though we just met you and you're you have this all-powerful device so they go to gwildor's little cave and we also find out that uh gwildor lives in the bronx because the amount of locks that he has on his little hovel is staggering what do you think gwildor's house smells like uh, feces and matted hair. <laughs> Cause it, when they show Gwildor going to his little house, I was like, where's the bathroom? <laughs> That's my first question. But so they, he takes them to his little house in the Bronx, as Nathan said. And, uh, soon those Skeletor's troops make, uh, find the house and they escape through this little passage so they can make it to the throne room at Castle Grayskull. Yep. However, much to their surprise, the throne room is empty, and they're like, oh, something is afoot. So they try to save the sorceress. <laughs> they never said anything that smart. I don't remember mo- most of the dialogue. <laughs> but Skeletor and the troops surround them, 
But Gwildor thankfully knows to use the cosmic key and gets them the fuck out yes, of there. Yes, and th- is this not where we're one of the first times where we're treated to a uh, terribly wasted Meg Foster? Oh, as Evil Lynn? Yeah. By the way, I thought she was wearing contacts. Those are her real eyes. What? Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Because I read that, like, she, uh... She, they, they basically were like, no, you're just gonna have your real eyes because they actually look so much, so much better than contacts could ever make <laughs> it them look. Would have been great. No, we're those. We're just gonna use your real eyes. And she had replied, but they're so unsettling. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the point, uh, Miss Foster. <laughs> Uh, but they did, uh, but they, in, in classic '80s movies, they did say, "Well, we're gonna give you a bit of a push up." <laughs> <laughs> That's a real thing, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and she wanted her hair to be long, and they said, no, it should be short. Well, Evil Lynn, if you're looking at the character model, which they clearly didn't because her outfit looked nothing like Evil Lynn's, mm-hmm. um, it was always quite tight back and never really noticed to be long and flowy. <laughs> I, I always thought her name was just Lynn before that. Yeah. <laughs> and then they just added evil to it. Well... It's, uh, I'm, obviously it's supposed to be a play on the, the name Evelyn. Yeah, yeah, right? for sure. So. <laughs> I just thought it'd be funny. <laughs> Lynn, we will give you a new name now that you've joined the ranks of Skeletor. <laughs> Evil <laughs> Lynn. It's like really <laughs> fucking creative, guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, it's cool, I guess. Also, she super wants to bone Skeletor. <laughs> well. She gives him that look several times. Yeah. I mean, I get it, but. <laughs> I mean, can you, like. I mean, Skeletor me... can get it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he reveals that it's Frank Langella, and she's like, eh, I'm, never mind, I'm good. <laughs> I was into the whole Bones thing, but. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, they uh, they took the Cosmic Key through a gateway, and they, it, was a, it ended up being a random gateway. Like, they don't know where they're going, but lo and behold, it's Earth, because kids. You wanted to see a He-Man movie, and guess what? You get to spend most of the movie on Earth, just like you wanted. (laughs) Yeah, I was, even as a kid, I was like, oh, oh, okay. (laughs) The story, it it reads like uh, a shitty short story that some kid wrote in fifth grade about how (laughs) they met He-Man. And he was magically transported through a portal and landed in Kansas. And he had big glistening muscles, and he had a talking (laughs) elf, and... (laughs) That stupid Orko wasn't there, because I hate Orko. Yeah. (laughs) Screw that guy. (laughs) But he had an Ewok that was kind of like Yoda. (laughs) But dumber. (laughs) Like me. (laughs) I made fifth grade. (laughs) So... (laughs) We meet the uh, most interesting characters of this movie, of course, the human characters, oh. played play by Courtney Cox, and uh, I didn't know this, but I guess the guy playing her boyfriend is from, like, some Star Trek show? Oh, because I have him noted as 1980s Matthew Lillard. Because <laughs> that's what he looked like to me. Now, here's the thing. I don't like the fact that these they have this whole human character subplot who I would argue they're almost the stars of the movie. I don't even mm-hmm. think it's He-Man's movie. But Courtney Cox, honestly, I think she's truly acting in this movie. Well, yeah, this is like one of her first big roles. Yeah, like I'm watching her in the movie. Like the first time when I was a kid, obviously, I didn't give a fuck about Courtney Cox, nor did I know who she was. But watching <laughs> it this time, I'm like... She is actually, like, doing all right in this movie. Yeah. Uh, for for the type of movie that it is. And I think maybe that's a thing that led her to greater success, is that she was like, well, this is probably not good, but I'm certainly not going to phone it in. No. And the thing is, other than this and the Bruce Springsteen video, mm-hmm. the only other role of substance that she had had at that point, I think, was she played Alex's girlfriend on Family Ties. Yeah, and that was only, like, a guest spot, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, Courtney Cox was, like, almost no one at the time. But, uh, basically we get her story, which is, like, her parents... Her parents died in a... This is kind of crazy. So her parents died in a plane crash 
on their way to Catalina because originally they wanted to drive down with her to the beach. But yeah. she said, no, I want to study as an excuse to hang out with her boyfriend. So they said, oh, you don't want to drive down to the beach with us? All right, we'll fly to Catalina. And Which, they... I mean, really? Yeah, I don't get that. I don't get how that was the alternative. <laughs> I, I don't also, if, if you're going to be flying, I, I don't mean to jump into American Ninja reality type stuff. Uh, but if you're going to fly somewhere, don't you have to file a flight plan with like the... Uh, the authority that oversees like flights throughout your country. Uh, yes, I don't think you can just be like, "All right, taking the FAA, plane." That's what it was. FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration. You have to file a flight plan with them. And Maybe they were think... also flight pa- plan filers. I don't think that it's something that you could do in such a quick amount of time. It's like, well. You know, we're gonna we were gonna go to the beach, uh, but our daughter wants to study, so you know, off to the airport and file a flight plan in five minutes. <laughs> like I said, they were flight plan filers. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, that's a, that. Yeah, I I heard that and I was like, what? That doesn't even like that's not even registering in my mind as a thing that could even happen. <laughs> There's nothing about that that makes sense. <laughs> But yeah, that's her story, and she's basically deciding to leave town. Also, this also brought up another point. They can afford a plane. Why didn't she get any money as an inheritance? Yeah, why is she working at that burger, that like chicken place? Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But so yeah, her story, and then she wants to. She basically is going to leave town forever because she can't deal with this town anymore. Memories of her parents. Uh, she doesn't really want to be with her boyfriend anymore because, of course, like that triggers the memory too. Is that she wanted to stay with him originally? She feels guilty, and yeah. So she, it's her last night in town. Meanwhile, here come he uh, he man and the masters of the universe who run afoul of a cow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which I I will say kind of a le- legitimately funny scene. Uh, although Gwildor talks a lot, so that was a negative. <laughs> well, no, he's like moo 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 moo. Yeah, <laughs> I would have like I I kind of wanted the cow to just like kick. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted critters esque subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> where the he 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 moo moos something to the cow and it's like just some ridiculous jumble of words and the cow moo moos back what the fuck is this guy saying <laughs> be great if only the cow was subtitled <laughs> but, but they go they go to this uh they end up at this chicken place they're hanging out they're watching to see what's going on gwildor steals a bucket of chicken with a fucking like ribs or a bucket of ribs with like a like a some kind of weird device of like grab grabby claw thing. How does how does he know that's food? Yeah, I don't know. He, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. But he stuffs it in his face and he drinks barbecue sauce and it's disgusting. <laughs> it's the grossest thing in this movie. It's all in his beard. It's like, let's. <laughs> oh. And I guess, like, are most people on Eternia vegetarians? Because when Tila finds out that it's a, an animal, her and uh, Gwildor don't seem to want to eat it anymore. I think it's the fact that in within her generation that possibly uh, meat is scarce. Mm. And that they don't eat animals, not because of any sort of altruism, although that may be her opinion. Yeah. It's just because it's not around. Uh, it is funny because she asks, why do they put the food on these nice little sticks? And her dad's like, that's a bone. Yep. <laughs> so clearly meat, eating meat was a thing for his generation, but it's not for hers. But yeah. And it's, and that's her father. Like he never taught her that. <laughs> well, it's, I actually taught a small neighbor child that inadvertently one time. <laughs> Uh, Emma had a friend of hers over to our house, and I have a, a deer head in my living room. It's mm-hmm. the first deer I ever caught, uh, or shot as a hunter. If you don't like that? Too bad. Come at me, bro. So, she sees it, and she's like, oh, that's, you know, is that a real deer head? And we're like, yeah. 
And she goes, I wouldn't do that. I was like, what do you mean? Well, I wouldn't go hunting. I couldn't shoot and uh shoot an animal i couldn't kill anything like that i'm like and she's eating a hamburger at the time and i said sweetheart what do you think that hamburger used to be (laughs) that was a cow that was an animal that died so you can eat (laughs) and she put her hamburger down and pushed it away oh dear i was like well you know what i don't think it's gonna last (laughs) not that kind of kid (laughs) Well, and I was just going to say that I know uh, Tila is not a vegan, though, because this is the only time she mentions she doesn't eat meat. <laughs> just her mentioning it to people like every well, throat. Hey, Skeletor, guess what? Just don't even... I'm a vegan, so... Okay, bye! <laughs> that That's what distracts him long enough for He-Man to defeat him. Yes. Your veganism saved Eternia. <laughs> oh, but I digress. So... Yeah, they're they're gross. They're eating chicken. Um, back at Castle Grayskull, Skeletor tells Evil Lynn, assemble a team and go find uh, the Cosmic Key, because obviously I need that to rule and shit. And I don't know... Yeah, I have something written down. Oh, oh one thing that in this movie that I fucking think is ridiculous is all these like made-up words uh, that that have to do with, I guess, the world we were in in this movie. Yeah. It's like someone calls someone you Ethernian worm bat. Well, like stuff like that. It's just like thrown in and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> yes. And it's weird because they do that. They, they introduce measurement, uh, like for time and space. They have their own words for they that. They rip off a star Wars one. They're like parsec. Well, or whatever. that's, a, that's actually a legitimate, um, measure of, uh, uh, space. Oh yeah, but uh, you know they took it because of Star Wars, right? But it's it's weird because they commit to it sometimes. Yeah, every other time it's interchangeable, which I always thought weird. I mean, as an adult, whenever it's like, oh, it's another planet. Why don't they have different terminologies for everything? I mean, obviously it would make it weird and hard to shoot an entire movie where uh, a house is called a spajunk door or whatever the <laughs> fuck you want to call it. Spajunk door is Just the best words up. euphemism for a house. <laughs> spajunk door. Uh. <laughs> Anyhow, we get introduced to some characters who never existed in the cartoon and I, one that did. I wrote down their names. I did Sorod, mm-hmm. Blade, yep, <laughs> sorry, Beast Man, yep. and Karg. Out of that four, Beast Man is the only one that was on the cartoon. And also, when they announced their names, I thought Karg. I thought they said Carl. Carl. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my god, it's amazing! It would be and great with just like Carl. a forty-five-year-old dude with glasses or something. Like, oh, no, Carl from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Hey <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Karg is like a weird fish face thing. Yeah, and he's got like long hair and stuff. I don't know. Yeah, he's got long. He's he's a he's got long silvery hair. Oh, my brother actually owned at one point the action figure for Zarad or whatever it's pronounced. Oh, Sorod or whatever. Sorod, the 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 snaky kind of guy, because they did they released some action figures for this, and my brother actually had this one and i don't recall seeing this in this movie but if you pull the lever on his back as the action figure he threw sparks oh, okay no yeah. I, I don't remember what he did in this movie if anything uh he went on one mission and then was killed so yeah but for <laughs> not and not even being the one that failed <laughs> right he was sacrificed for nothing uh but So, man, we are not even, like, 20 minutes into this movie. (laughs) So, Courtney Cox and her boyfriend are, uh, you know, hanging out at the cemetery. Sound testing, because he's in a band. Well, first they hang out at the cemetery to visit her parents' grave, because that's where they find the cosmic key. Yes. And, again, this is where we get, oh, it's a Japanese synthesizer. Of course it is. Yeah, that's what it is. 
And then, yes, they go sound testing because uh, it's it's an 80s movie, so there has to be at least one character in a shitty band. That plays keyboards. It plays keyboard. And that's Kevin, uh, Cor- uh, Cox's uh, boyfriend. And he's testing out this cosmic key thing. It opens up and does this, like, light show, which proves to me that in the 80s they hadn't quite know, they didn't quite know how to set eye lines for that kind of stuff yet. Because they're not really looking at it right. Right. And they kind of, like, look up and down, and, like, you clearly the actors are like, what the fuck are we supposed to be looking at? And, well, here's the thing. If this maybe had been uh, a Warner Brothers production, or Paramount, or Columbia, mm-hmm. they may have actually been able to pull that off. But it's canon. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's maybe three steps up from Ed Wood. <laughs> Yeah. And I love these movies to death. Honest to God, I love canon films because they're so schlocky and cliched and trope filled. But like you said, when you cross over into something that I already kind of hold dear, you, mm-hmm. you can't bring that kind of game. Yeah, like I said, they they just need to stick to the when they stick to their own properties. Mm-hmm. They're usually very dumb movies, but that's not to say they're not entertaining. Right, but. So they're testing out this uh, this device, and Kevin is like, you know what? I gotta go see my friend Charlie. Yeah, Charlie, who is like dressed like half a village person. Yeah, <laughs> and wearing like a th- it looked like to me. I don't think it was, but it looked like to me he was wearing like a jacket for like manga or something. But he goes to Charlie's little like music store to to see what's going on, leaving Julie alone at the high school. Mm-hmm. I just said her character's name again, interchangeably going back and forth. We just call her Courtney Cox. <laughs> Leave Courtney Cox alone in the in the high school, and that's when the uh, the evil Skeletor crew come in. And which I love. There's like a big explosion and yep. like a light show and stuff. And she's just like, "Hello." <laughs> no, that's great. I also love that the fact that apparently when you travel via space portal, you have to strike a pose. When you jump out of the portal. Well, yeah, that goes without saying. That's like when that's like when a superhero does the superhero pose when they land. Right. So, while Courtney Cox slash Julia is being uh, accosted by the Skeletor crew... Uh, name <laughs> that sounds my, like a great band. Name of my next band. <laughs> um, the janitor shows up to help. Why does the janitor have a letter jacket on? <laughs> I don't know. Like, is he the? I thought he was the janitor. That's is that, or was he like the like a school coach? Wait, isn't that the guy that like Kevin was supposed to meet there? Is it? I think so because then later, because he's the guy who basically gets pulverized and taken into the ambulance later, right? Yeah, and he's like, and when Kevin show, and the guy's like, you don't even want to know, man. Yeah, no, I think that was supposed to be Kevin's friend that was going to meet them. Okay, so that yeah. that tracks then. All right, I took a bad note then. All right, th- we take it back. This movie is flawless. <laughs> yes, because that was the one thing that, that was hinging. Yep. It was mm-hmm. the only thing. Yep. But luckily, He-Man sees this uh, young uh, actress from Friends in distress. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, hey, I'm a fan of that show in the 90s. I better save her so it ha- still happens. I mean, if you, re- if you really wanted to just keep this timeline specific, man, I love... That Bruce Springsteen video, I have to save you. <laughs> well, I thought this was a prequel to that because she said she was going to move to New Jersey. Right? And that's <laughs> on my note when she said that was, yeah, she's got to go dance with Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, this is totally before Courtney Cox's career takes off. I think she's playing herself. I think the name Julie is just a, a cover. Getting this thing solved. <laughs> she told me I'm going then and she's like, listen, I want you to tell my life story, but I don't want it to be obvious that it's about me. Can you just like throw <laughs> He-Man in there or something? Change my name to, I don't know, Julie. <laughs> so He-Man makes the save and pretty easily takes down like four people. Oh my, he is... And a bunch of stormtroopers. But with a gun, with guns. With guns, and to be fair, to be fair, to be fair, he also like hides for most of the fight. <laughs> well, you know, strategy and retreat is just as important as battle. Mm. I mean, especially considering the fact that he's got 
no armor on except for that cape, which he gives to Courtney Cox. Well, and those pecs. Well, yeah. I mean, I I think those could stop a bullet. Probably. Or a ray gun or whatever. But uh, he, he, yeah, he basically single-handedly does most of the work, and then Tila and Man-at-Arms show up and kind of chase them away. And that's when Ske- they go back to Skeletor, and Skeletor fucking disintegrates Sorod for no reason. <laughs> Kevin comes back to the high school, which has been basically almost burned to the ground. Oh, but we, be- during this, we get to, s- we get to meet uh, Principal Strickland. Yeah, I know. I, I wrote down, I was like, that, that detective looks like a real slacker. <laughs> and in all honesty, other than Frank Langella, he is also one of my, one of the only bright spots for this movie for me. Yeah, he's a, uh, I mean, he's a character actor, doing the same character most of the time. But <laughs> most of the time, but it really works here, and he does a good job with it. Yeah, he gets some insane things to do and say, but yes. Yes! Uh, so yeah, he shows up and he's basically like, it's funny because like he basically takes over this investigation and just goes wherever Kevin goes. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's like, yeah, I'll go with you to this, uh, what's the, what's that, cosmic, what's it? Yeah, let's go check it out. Oh, I'm from New York. <laughs> <laughs> Forget about it. Uh, so they go to, uh, Courtney Cox's house mm-hmm. to look for her. And this, oh, this is where I wrote down the note because he puts some food in the microwave and at the same time Skeletor's people can see that he's using the cosmic key because again he thinks it's a synthesizer Mm -hmm. and they're like oh we gotta we gotta track the signal and they're like we can't there's interference because there's a microwave being used well like just destroy it yeah so they don't know it's a microwave they just say destroy the source of the interruption (laughs) Yeah, they destroy the source. So the microwave blows up, and the note I wrote down was, wow, that fire extinguisher was very conveniently located. You're supposed to have one in your kitchen. Right by the microwave. Well, maybe not right by the microwave. But... Yeah, because literally it's like, blow up, fire extinguisher. <laughs> like, immediately. <laughs> there was a, a moment just before where they did this, when He-Man uh, saved Courtney Cox did you notice that Tila got a little catty about that whole thing? Oh, yeah, because she was like, oh, I see you got lucky. Not as lucky, yeah, oh, no, we got lucky. Not as lucky as you, apparently. Like, Tila wants to get that He-Man dick. Well, he does have the power. Hey, <laughs> probably a really small dick, though, let's be honest. <laughs> well, no, he holds aloft his magic sword. Yeah, no, he's kind of overcompensating with that thing. Well, maybe in this one, because he uses guns. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> He-Man with guns. <laughs> and yeah, you're right. This is, I mean, we we have that, and then the whole thing with, uh, I, I feel that Skeletor could have used a leadership retreat, because he's he's not effectively leading. He He's pushing his employees around. Like you said, he disintegrated poor Scarlack, or whatever the hell the guy's name was, who's not important because he wasn't in the cartoon. <laughs> I, think, I think you've used a different name each time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Scar... I think Scarlack, isn't that the what thing in the pit from Star Wars? That's a Sarlacc. I mean, oh. I might as well rip off Star Wars. They did. <laughs> yeah. He he definitely needs to go to a few conferences. <laughs> but, uh, so, Principal Strickland is like, listen, I'm taking this cosmic key. You can have it. At- I'm going to go check it through the system. I don't know how he's going to do that. Did you like when he was, when he still thought it was a synthesizer, uh, that Strickland was playing it, like, but with his knuckles? <laughs> was he? Yeah. Like, anytime uh, Kevin or Charlie touch it, they're playing it with their fingers like a piano. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the Detective Strickland, because I don't know what his name was. We're just going to call him Detective Strickland. <laughs> he was, his name was Lubick. Detective Strickland yep. takes the <laughs> cosmic key and he starts knuckling down on it. Like playing it like a piano, but with the, the first rung of knuckles on his hand. He's like, I don't know how to play no friggin' piano. I'm just a bald detective who used to be a principal in California. 
Detective Strickland. I bend my fingers for uh, exercise because I ain't no slacker when I play the piano. Yeah. So yeah, he's going to run that through the system for yeah. reasons. <laughs> Which I guess, yeah, just scan the barcode, right? Yeah. Why did why did they throw the Burger King wrappers in the sink like they were going to wash them? I t- yeah, please tell me, because I don't know. That was the weirdest thing ever. That was the weirdest last-minute product placement shot. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it would have made sense if they threw, like, just a shot of him throwing them in the garbage, and you can clearly see the logo. These people who are saving the universe eat at Burger King. Perfectly fine. Maybe they did that shot and Burger King was like, whoa, 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 our food's not going in the garbage whether it's done or not done. <laughs> so you put it in the sink and <laughs> you, wash it with reverence. You reuse those. <laughs> and when you come back to Burger King, can I get a Whopper? Oh, no, hold on. I've got a wrapper. Just put it in here. In Burger King, environmentally conscious before it was cool. <laughs> not a sponsor, so fuck you, Burger King. <laughs> Hot take. Oh, Just no, like their angry Whopper. Available now. Hey, wait a second. Oh, but really, what I'm trying to say is have it your way. (laughs) You know, this podcast, I'm loving it. So, anywho. Anyways, yes. uh, The troops show up to Kevin's house because they think the key is there, but, you know, uh, Strickland's already taken it away. So they put, I guess, I just called it the collar of conformity because I don't know what it was. Or the collar of confession. Because there you go. he slaps it on, they slap it on him, and I'm like, oh shit, it's Running Man now. But they're <laughs> not going to blow his head up. No. Evil Lynn is apparently Wonder Woman, because this thing... Yes, the lasso of truth, that's what I thought too. When she slaps it around his neck, he can't lie to her. Right. So... And yeah, she get basically, he tells her, to this movie's credit, I will say, it doesn't do that movie thing that I hate in movies, is where... A character has to tell another character everything that's happened so far, and it, you have to listen to it again, even though it's everything we've already fucking seen. Yeah. So to this movie's credit, he's about to do that, and we cut away. Yeah. Because I, man, that is a cool thing. I really, I'm like, all right, yeah, I know. Like, I get you're telling this character, but you're also telling the audience who just fucking watched it. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but yeah, he uh, he basically is telling her everything that happened off screen, and then where do we go from there? I believe well, they show up to free him from the clutches of yes. the lasso of truth. How does Detective Strickland get back into the picture? Oh, because he no, how does he get back into the picture? Because he shows back up with the cosmic key again. Yeah, oh, oh no, I remember what happens. He goes to Charlie's music store. Right. To find out to find out if he knows anything about it. And, and that's when the crew starts showing up, as well as Skeletor in the slowest moving like parade float oh I've ever God. seen. The weird th- thing is too, when he they show up, uh, of course, he has to ask Charlie if the thing could be Russian because it was the eighties and the Cold War. Oh, just wait, uh, coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, I think you, you're you the circus act I've been looking for all night. He really acts nonplussed that a man in a loincloth carrying a sword, wearing a cape, shows up with two uh, Broadway militants. I don't know, because they've got like unitards on. And they, but they're dressed like soldiers, Tila and Man at Arms, and he has a small elf dwarf hairball thing. You know what? You know what it is, Nathan. What's that? It's New York. Forget about it. Uh, I would if they clearly weren't in like Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, they must be in California because the parents were gonna fly to Catalina. Filmed on location in New York City. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the, uh, yeah, he's he is very nonplussed by everything. I think that's another reoccurring thing we see in a lot of these movies is mm-hmm. that no one reacts to like insane shit, right? You know what we forgot to mention that, that? Wildor hot wired a pink Cadillac. D- oh yeah, and he shows up in like Hawaiian clothes later or something. Yeah, I actually have Gwildor goes Hawaiian. They 
they paid for that pink Cadillac, and boy, howdy, did they use it? Because the oh, amount of yeah. B-roll with the with the pink caddy was quite quite numerous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and the big, big fight. fight with the slow parade. Look. Yes, and in the it, it, so you know most of the most of the uh, people are fighting outside, whereas like Courtney Cox is being watched over by I think it's like Courtney Cox, Kevin, Gwildor, and uh, Charlie and Principal Strickland are in another room because mm-hmm. Gwildor is trying to get the cosmic key going again, right? So they can get out of there, uh, go to Skeletor's castle, I guess. And yeah, and Evil Lynn shows up to uh, to trick. Courtney oh, Cox. The one of the dumbest like plot conven things for the sake of plot convenience because all of a sudden I'm not saying she's a fucking rocket scientist. No, she's bag of rocks dumb about this. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like before this though, like she's fine. She's like whatever. But in this scene they make her so dumb. Yeah, she she would have gone to her parents' funerals. Yeah. Right? There there would have been some sort of I'm guessing body recovery. She likely saw bodies like for evil Lynn to make it sound like it's Peter Parker's mom. <laughs> we had to disappear. We had, we were working with like clandestine. I'm, not, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, we were working with like, we had to hide because of the secrets that we knew. And it's like, Fuck you, movie. <laughs> yeah, really. That's, that's what I mean. Like, it's the most egregious example of making a character super dumb just so one scene can happen. Yeah, because she immediately goes back and yoink the key. Thanks, bye. Yeah, just we just need the, totally just need the cosmic key for our research. And she's like, oh, that's all it's going to take? Well, howdy, just give me a moment. Mm-hmm. She's, yeah, she steals it, gives it to her. She reveals, of course, it's evil in. That no take. No! Yeah, she does. She even does the no thing where she's like quickly grabbing at her own face. Mm hmm. But, um. And I ha- actually have a shot, uh, or a note of a shot right after this. There is a literal dumpster fire. <laughs> which That's... this movie has now devolved to. That's perfect. Mm hmm. Um, and then we get a, a sign in a movie that I feel like if this is in a movie, 99% of the time, it's a bad movie. We get hoverboards, <laughs> yeah. 99%. There is back to the future part two, yeah. <laughs> but most of the time. So they come in on these like fucking, the guys come in on these hoverboards and yes, this is a scene you were talking about where they're clearly not flying through the air. No. And he man steals one of them. And starts like, and he manages to actually get the cosmic key back. And here's the thing: Return Return of the Jedi came out in '83. There is a speeder bike chase in that movie where Luke and Leia and other stormtroopers are speeding through Endor, the forest moon planet, and it looks more realistic than the flying that takes place in this movie on those hoverboards. Because they look like tabletop figures that you would use for, like, a Dungeons & Dragons game, all posed, sitting on, like, a platform with their feet welded to it, and all they're doing is just turning them in time to where they should be in the scene. And I guarantee you that Return of the Jedi had as much, if not a little bit more, in the budget. Like, it was not a huge difference. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, that was 80s George Lucas. He knew what to do with, like, very little. Yeah. So, the hoverboard fight. Yeah. So, again, that renders that whole evil Lynn taking the cosmic key thing kind of useless. That yeah. scene did, doesn't even need to happen because He-Man just gets it back again. Mm-hmm. And then, I guess you got to pad the film, which is already an hour and 45 minutes. So, I don't know why it needs that scene. So, yeah. Air jousting. Air jousting. <laughs> At least they didn't have heart-shaped pillows on mace handles. <laughs> that would have been even better. <laughs> Thrashing. I do like that. Uh, um, the movie. There's this movie has a couple of like movie references. Like this reminds me of blah blah blah, and they don't make any sense. Like Charlie is like, this reminds me of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I'm like, have you seen that movie? Where are the pod people? Yeah, which fucking part of that movie does He Man? 
<laughs> this is He-Man movie remind you of. Uh. Well, Skeletor, uh, he they do that slow rising. <laughs> very, very slow. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he stops Courtney Cox's character by giving her an Electro Charlie horse. <laughs> yep. These are things that happen in this movie. Yeah, we're not making any of this I know it sounds up. insane coming out of my mouth and Brendan's mouth. But people, I know, if you haven't seen it, these are things that really happen in this movie. Somebody wrote this on paper, filmed it, and said, Guys, we're nailing it. Right? <laughs> um, <sighs> but, but yeah, so Skeletor basically has everyone surrounded except and then he-man comes in for the save but it's of course it's a trap and they capture him too they get the cosmic key back and skeletor is like he-man you're going to be my slave or i'm gonna kill all your friends right here in front of you Mm -hmm. and is at this point that i noted that i checked the time on the movie and i said how the fuck is there 40 minutes left yeah I like this is like to me this is like the scene right before the last fight or something. And it still is, but holy shit there's a lot of movie left. And the worst part about all of this stuff, I think, is that this story could have easily been transposed if they had just taken a couple of extra days and wrote Kevin and Julie as villagers in some podunk town on eternia and like some of the more egregious sins about this movie about it being a he-man movie not taking place on eternia would just be out the window and i heard someone the other day give the the um not excuse but a reason they may not have they may have filmed on earth as like budgetary reasons but you could make any place look like another planet yeah. Go film in the desert. That's what George Lucas did. He filmed Star Wars in the desert, and it did not look like Earth. It was awesome. Right. So, don't don't give me that excuse, Gary Goddard. <laughs> I know your friends. I know you're hanging out with Brian Singer at those weird parties. <laughs> so, yeah. So, obviously, He-Man is like, take me as your slave, I guess. It would have been, although it would have been funny if he was like, kill everyone. I'll never serve <laughs> you. <laughs> and and what is the, the symbol that uh, that He Man has to give up to show he is Skeletor's slave, the Sword of Grayskull, which he lost earlier. Oh, so he shouldn't even have it, right? I mean, he, they didn't. He didn't lose it like as part of the story or plot convenience. Plot. But there was one scene earlier where he's like, I think he's ducking into a door, mm-hmm. and it catches. Oh, no. And you can see the sword come halfway out of the sheath, ready to fall out, and he continues on through the door, and in true Golan Globus fashion, they're like, just leave it. It's fine. It's fine. (laughs) Okay, because I actually, when you said that, I said, oh, yeah, I think there was a point in the plot when he lost it, but I didn't even notice that shot. That's amazing. Yeah. (laughs) So Skeletor leaves. Oh, well, first he poisons... uh, Courtney Cox, he like zaps her in the leg or something. That's with the Electro Charlie horse. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. So she's uh, she's basically slowly dying and the, the they don't have the cosmic key anymore and Goldor's like, all hope is lost. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, uh, Detective Strickland is trying to convince his cop buddies that he's not crazy. <laughs> they see <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> they, they see Kevin drive by in the pink Cadillac and he's like, there they are! So they're on the, they're on the charge. And then Nathan, how do they figure out a way that they can get to Castle Grayskull? Oh, well, Kevin just apparently has a perfect pitch Mm -hmm. and can remember the tones exactly as they played. I think, though, that they could have saved a lot of time if they had just gone and rented a, a Columbia movie release on VHS because the music... That is used to create the wormhole to Eternia. Again, these are things that really happened in the movie, people. (laughs) Sounds exactly like the opening music for the old Columbia Pictures. Like that boom, doon, 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 doon. That's 
Columbia Pictures. That sound is what Columbia Pictures had at the time. Probably because it didn't cost too much to reuse. I guess. Um, I also wrote down that just before that, when when Courtney Cox is kind of laying there, like slowly, slowly dying, the way Kevin is like patting her hair, I was like, "What is he, Lenny and of Mice and Men or something?" <laughs> <laughs> Lenny saved a pretty lady. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, back at Castle Eternia, Skeletor looks absolutely ridiculous with his, like, gold fucking costume, which I'm sure Frank Langella did not enjoy wearing. Well, that happens after they put the Sword of Eternia, but before they do that, or the Sword of Greyskull, rather, into the sheath, Blade is having the time of his life making He-Man his BDSM submissive oh with the yeah electro whip it gets very homoerotic oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because like i don't think again this is 1987 so i don't think uh they had the timing real good because as he's whipping him dolph lundgren at times like barely moves his body <laughs> or he jerks too soon yeah too soon yeah. or like in the wrong direction or something and i'm like yeah. what <laughs> Oh, another time they reference something weird is uh, Pris- uh, Detective Strickland is like, what is this, the Twilight Zone? When he goes into space. And I'm like, or, you know, I don't know, Star Trek maybe would have been more appropriate. <laughs> they uh, they did miss an excellent opportunity to give the nod about the whole power of Skull mm-hmm. Because uh, <laughs> Langella has a line as Skeletor, because this is where he puts the sword in the computer sheath, uh, which gives him his powers. So it's basically another King Arthur tale, yes. Kind of, but in reverse, because he's putting it into the rock. Right. He delivers a line uh, where all the forces of Grey's Skull will grow to the powers of the universe. I'm like, why didn't you switch that? The power of Grey's Skull. You... Mm. Golden Globus, ladies and gentlemen. But, uh, yeah, so the gang shows up uh, to to save He-Man, I guess. But I'm trying to remember what happens here. He bra- Oh, so yeah, so they show up and they start fighting off. Uh, I guess they're called Centurions, because that's what I wrote down. The His army or whatever. They're stormtroopers. So, uh, meanwhile, Skeletor tries to zap He-Man, but he accidentally zaps the chain. One of the chains that's holding him down, so He-Man breaks free. Mm-hmm. And uh, he man well, because it's... they tr- when they transported the uh, when they got the cosmic key working, uh, they they do transport almost like like a, that section of Earth was taken from Earth and put into Eternia, which beforehand oh, right. <laughs> it's always been portals. I did like the the yeah, but it did give us the great visual of half the Cadillac. Yeah, they basically were transported on a Nika playset. Yeah. <laughs> like, do. whenever you buy, like, the collectible, like, the Crow or Freddy Krueger, <laughs> and they're, like, a they're supposed to be posable in a, a bit of their environment, that's what this looked like. And we should say that uh, Detective Strickland also gets caught up in this because he's just about to ar- try to arrest them, and he gets taken into the portal. Yeah. So he's also at, at uh, Castle Grayskull. <laughs> So a giant fight breaks out. He-Man breaks free and he has one of the most underwhelming fights, I think, with Skeletor. Because he starts shooting stuff first. He's yep. like shooting things again. And He-Man uh, no, finally takes Skeletor down and he falls into a pit. That's nothing like Return of the Jedi and how the Emperor dies. So don't even try to say that. Or that, you know, thing that Luke fell down at the end of Empire. Right. Right. Hmm. Also, I want to say this. I have a theory about this movie. Uh, earlier, Tila mentions that they need a Tesseract, and uh, Skeletor falls into red goop. So I'm guessing that this is where they tie, it ties into the MCU. He becomes <laughs> Red Skull. Somehow he gets an Italian accent and ends up in Captain America 1990. <laughs> Which is weird, because any time He-Man crossed over, it was always with DC properties. Oh, shit. <laughs> well, this is, this, is how the, uh, this is how the stones started. <laughs> He-Man was... Masters of the Universe is actually the first MCU movie, not Iron Man. 
I I would watch uh, Avengers Eternity War. <laughs> or I would War. love <laughs> if Dolph Lundgren just made a cameo as He Man in the next one. <laughs> Jesus, what the hell happened to you, He-Man? <laughs> Time has not been kind. I'm 68 years old. <laughs> uh, so, despite Skeletor being dead, there's still a lot of wrap-up th- at this point to do. We do get, right before the end of the battle, we do get the an I have the power. Mm. It's the only nod I feel they properly gave to... The original series, except for one throwaway line about Skeletor being the Lord of Snake Mountain. Yeah, there's not a lot of uh, fan service where sometimes it's egregious the fan service in these movies, and sometimes you're like, "All right, give us something." Yeah, this was this was the opposite. This was anemic with the <laughs> fan service. Uh, so we get this like. What I think is hilarious is really, like, heartfelt goodbye. Like, Courtney Cox crying as she sang goodbye to everyone. I'm like, you barely interacted with most of these people. Also, they apparently bought Strickland a wife. (laughs) Yeah, he's like, I'm gonna stay here. I got a beautiful girl. I got a castle. Forget about it. (laughs) This is is him. uh, See, what happened was he was a principal first, and then he became a detective, and then he retired in in Eternia. Okay, well, there you go. Character arc complete. I would watch an entire movie, by the way, of Strickland just being an Eternia. <laughs> just, or a sitcom. How great would that just be? It's a fish out of water sitcom oh with Strickland God. living in Eternia. I used to go to the grocery store, but now I gotta get this liquid. What am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> you got no microwaves up here! So Slackers? So, Courtney Cox and Kevin... Uh, are like going back to Earth, and Gwildor is like, I can open a doorway, I can even send you back in time, which that's just introduced now, all of a sudden. <laughs> and and Cory Cox is like, No, no, we're good. And at the last second, she's like, Gwildor, wait, zap, too late. So she definitely didn't say anything there, just keep that in mind. And then she wakes up, everything's a little different. Her parents are still alive. Oh no, it's the day they decide to take their flight to Catalina before they've planned their flight plan. Holy shit, Nathan, I just thought of something. That's why they crashed. They didn't do the flight plan properly. Okay. I I did look it up. It it takes about it takes about 1 to 2 hours to file a flight plan with the FAA. Then if they haven't already filed the flight plan, mm-hmm. They have, conservatively, an hour, if not two hours, to wait before they can even fly. Then they have to fly to Catalina. By the time they get there, they're going to turn around and come right back because it's supposed to be a day trip. (laughs) Maybe maybe they were like, you know what? uh, We can ask her to go to the beach, but our daughter's probably going to want to fuck her boyfriend and she's going to make up an excuse. So let's let's just flight plan this Catalina trip just in case. And then we'll go ask her. Brilliant. (laughs) But anyway, she's, yeah, they haven't left yet. So she's like, no, don't leave. I'm taking your keys and runs out of the house. And then Kevin runs out of his house because apparently he was also transported. Well, he would have been. I mean, he was with her when they went, right? Yeah. Also, how did Gwildor know, though? Also, why? Okay. Hmm. Why does this not create two Julia's and two Kevin's because he didn't transport their essence. He transported their physical beings in terms of getting time travel mostly right in a movie. This is like the opposite of what Endgame did. Yes. (laughs) Like this couldn't be any more like, ugh, movie time travel. (laughs) And also, like, it's kind of a weird message because you think, like, by the end of the movie, it'll teach her, like, how to, you know, deal with her grief and everything. And it's like, mm-hmm. no, no, we just reversed it. Congrats, they're alive. <laughs> like, in most of these movies end like that, you know, she the, the, she decides she would maybe decide to stay in the t- town and she wouldn't blame herself and she'd live with Kevin and be happy. Um, so it's kind of weird for me, I think. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that's uh, Masters of the Universe. Wait, it's not over. 
Because what happens after the, after all the credits, Nathan? If you have the patience to sit through the entire credits, or you know what, fast forward. Through Definitely that. fast forward. Dude, the the fast forward. Yes. Wait, what, uh, are, are you doing Rain Man impressions? Uh, Def, definitely, definitely, definitely fast definitely forward. Fast forward. Definitely fast forward. Uh, we get Skeletor popping up out of the red goop saying, I'll be back. And then you hear, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and he becomes Red Skull. This was, suppo- this was supposed to have a sequel. <sighs> but it will have a remake, apparently, if it ever yeah. happens. But... He, the in, and then it's probably one of the more I don't know poorly kept secrets or trivia tidbits because it's a tidbit uh, that's trivia and it's tri- trivia tidbit tidbit. Uh, well, that's an int- you mean it's an interesting tidbit because it's a tidbit that's interesting. This because an interesting tidbit because it's it. a tidbit that's interesting. Yeah, right. Uh, a, a lot of the sets uh, or money that was earmarked to be Masters of the Universe two. Ended up being the movie Cyborg. With Jean-Claude Van Damme? Yes. Uh, also, mm-hmm. dir- well, not this isn't directed by Albert Pune, but that one was directed by Albert Pune. Yep. Who we talked about in the classic Captain America. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, Masters of the Universe. Uh, Nathan, I'm going to say, first of all, as a, in, on, the, on the question of recommending, I am mm-hmm. somewhat in the middle here. I think... As a ridiculous movie, it certainly has some entertainment value. Yes. Uh, however, it may also infuriate you, depending on who you are. So I would well, put it right in the middle as a, as a qualifier, depending on how big of a He-Man fan you are or how big of a Canon Films fan you are. So take that yeah. as, it, as you will. Yep. I, I, would, I would recommend it just because it, it's one of those movies that stands as an example of how wrong something can be gotten. Yep. <laughs> when we watch this, because Patty watched this with me, she actually, she was having an allergy flare up and was rubbing her eyes. She goes, oh, it hurts so much. And I thought she was talking about the movie. <laughs> Fair. Yeah, and, and she's like, well, no, that too, but my eyes from the allergies as well. <laughs> Both of those things apply. And this is this is one of the rare moments where someone saying a, a movie, for lack of better terms, raped their childhood. Mm. Because this happened during my childhood. Okay? It's like... When Michael Bay put out the Transformers movies and everybody was going on about their childhood being ruined. Asshole, you're 28 years old. Okay? (laughs) Your childhood was not ruined by this. Some other child, who's a child right now, possibly may have had their childhood enhanced by this. So shut up, go back and watch the first generation of Transformers and be happy, you boring twat. When I was a kid, at this time, He-Man was a thing. And the show had maybe been off the air for a few years when this came out. I was still firmly planted within my childhood. So to see this movie as a representation of... Another part of my childhood, which was still happening at the time. This movie did, in fact, negatively impact my childhood because I was a child when it happened. Hot take. Fair. Um, I will say my take on the Transformers movies isn't that it affected childhood in any way. They were just terrible. (laughs) That, that, yes. And (laughs) that's acceptable because they're not very good. No. All right, so we're going to take a brief break, and we will be right back. What Were They Thinking is brought to you by HostGator. HostGator is a leading provider of shared, reseller, VPS, and dedicated hosting solutions. Award-winning support is available 24-7, 365 days a year via phone, email, and live chat. Discover why over 9 million websites trust HostGator. Use the coupon code SCHLUCK for 25% off your first purchase. That's SCHLUCK. S-C-H-L-O-C-K for 25% off your first purchase. 
What Were They Thinking is brought to you today by GameItAll.com. Whether it's video game news, the latest in music, or movie reviews, GameItAll.com is your one-stop shop for all nerdy talk. Nathan, there's a new app you should download. Do tell. Well, it's called PodCoin. Okay. And what did it? You listen to podcasts already. Yeah, I do. Well, how would you like to listen to podcasts and get something for it in return? Oh, you mean like a pat on the back? Well, no, but even besides that, besides entertainment value and besides mm-hmm. uh, improving your the, the nature of your character. Right. Uh, because that's what we do on this podcast. That's our number one yes. goal. Yeah. What you can get is actually, you can get what these, they're called pod coins. What? And with these, yeah. So with these pod coins, which you get per minute by listening to whatever podcast you normally listen to, you can exchange them for gift cards, or if you're feeling no. philanthropic, you can donate to charity. Really? Yeah. And uh, if you sign up with this app, which you can get on your iOS device, or you can get on the mm-hmm. Google Play Store if you have an Android phone, uh, you can use our promo code, WWTTPD. Oh, like our police department? Yeah, like our What Were They Thinking police department. Okay. And you'll receive a bonus 300 pod coins just for signing up. As Balky Bartokamus would say, get out of the city. Listen to Bronson. Not only that, but if you listen to our podcast, you also get 1.5 times the normal amount of pod coins you would get. So download that PodCoin app, and if you're already signed up, you can still use that promo code if you haven't used one yet. And again, it's WWTTPD, or as Nathan said, the What Were They Thinking Police Department, uh, on your pod- PodCoin app. Hook it up. Get them coins. Listen to them casts. Make it rain. Philanthropy, of course. What were they thinking? All right, we're back. Yes, we are back. Hmm, Nathan? Yes, Brendan? I think it's time we dip our feet into the poetic waters. Yes, it's time for the low haiku. 17 syllables to represent the film, quote-unquote, we just watched and talked about. Mm -hmm. You go ahead. Okay. What? There's no battle cat? What in the actual fuck? Frank did a good job. Steve? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know how Steve I, got in the I, studio. I, I, not sure. I thought he was busy. I Actually, Steve, how, what, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess Steve is also Gauss. Right. All right, here's mine. <clears throat> He-Man movie, kids. Are you all real excited? It takes place on Earth. Uh, yay, but also boo. Boo (laughs) for that ending. (laughs) Ah. I feel like I just got knocked by the sword of Grayskull. I I feel that someone played a shitty keyboard and we were sucked through a portal. Oh, or a porthole. There you go. (laughs) Oh, Nathan, uh, we talked a lot about this movie. We said what we thought of it, but what do we also always say? Well, we also say... Don't take a word for us! (laughs) That's right. Don't, because... Let's take a look here. Rotten Tomatoes. This movie, critics awarded this film with a 17%. I mean, 17% of critics liked it. You know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the audience, uh, quite a bit higher, but still rotten, uh, 40%. (laughs) And that's that's fair. It's 100% fair. Yeah. I feel like 40 is because... Some people didn't, uh, I feel like a lot of people didn't really care about the, how close it was to the He-Man thing, and they were like, this is just dumb and stupid and whatever, it's fine. Mm-hmm. But uh, let's go through some of these critics' reviews here. Uh, I got the first one here from Desmond Ryan of the Philadelphia Inquirer, because inquiring minds want to know. Yes. <laughs> 
He says, with with Masters of the Universe, the latest numbskull entertainment from the creators of Cl- Castle Grayskull, He-Man makes the transition from animation to live action. Taking a live actor along for the ride might have helped. <laughs> you know what? That's some garbage. Because, like you said earlier, Dolph Lundgren was basically speaking his stuff phonetically. Yeah. Uh, considering that he, the acting that he did, not knowing three quarters of what he was saying, I think he did a fine job. Also, he apparently is a, uh, a chemical scientist. Oh, yeah. No, I, I did hear that, too. Yeah. He has, like, a degree in science. Like, he's an actual chemist. He's a pretty smart dude. Yeah. So I don't, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't feel that's fair. Okay. To say, although, on, or they're, unless they were talking about Tila. Totally. That's who they're definitely <laughs> yeah. talking about. Man at arms. <laughs> right. Uh. And also, I, I don't feel that this was the, the fault of the creators of Gary Skull. Uh, I think it definitely more fell into the, this is your fault, canon films. Uh, are you blaming the people that did the landscaping for Castle Grayskull? <laughs> yeah, I definitely see the brush strokes. <laughs> Anyhow, Joanna Steinmetz of the Chicago Tribune notes that everyone knows how the battles will turn out. It's what's between them that raises Masters of the Universe to ever so oh, sorry to ever slow slightly above the mediocre. Is that a fresh review? It's a fresh one. Okay. I don't necessarily feel that it raises it above mediocre, but uh, <laughs> there you go. Well, Bob Morris of the Orlando Sentinel said, If nothing else, we can probably thank Lundgren for ensuring that there will be no more Rambo movies in the near future, because he has obviously depleted the world's supply of body grease. <laughs> Spoiler alert, there were two more and another one coming up. Yeah, Last Blood. Yeah. Coming soon? Probably. Probably. <laughs> Considering the story of John Rambo, as far as literature goes, ended at the end of First Blood. Yep. Super yeah. different movie from the rest of them. Yes. Uh, Michael Wilmington uh, from the Los Angeles Times wrote... Or writes, wrote, what the fuck is that? I don't know. Wrote. A misfiring, underdone epic that takes its inspiration not from life or literature, but from a toy line and the cartoon series it inspired. There you go. I don't feel that this movie took much interpretations or inspirations from that either. So. Uh, I think if you go back to the beginning of the episode, you had said quite clearly that this is spot on recreation. <laughs> Yeah, that's why I had that whole tangent about all the little things that bugged me about this movie. Yeah, that was well, that was satirical. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, the last critics one I want I'm the last critics run for me anyway is uh, from Roger Hurlbert of the South Florida Sun Sentinel. Wow. And he says, well, surprise winning. <laughs> yep. If not for the superb villainy of Frank Langella, who plays the evil Skeletor, Masters of the Universe would be as barren as an astro- asteroid. Yep. I think that's fair. Although, I, Eric Henderson of Slant Magazine, I think he takes a, a different look at it. No one is up to Frank Langella's pouting Skeletor in Masters of the Universe. It's true. Yeah. All right, let's, uh, ready to go into the doldrums here? Yes, let's. Okay, this one is a five-star review from an audience member, (laughs) and he or she says, because I I always forget to check their names, but he or she says, a true gem of the 80s and just gets better over time. None of your CGI garbage you see these days, but awesome costumes and practical effects. What the hell was the terrible flying effects then? That was super practical. Oh, Judge D. That's this person's name. This It's four stars. Uh, this film deserves a higher score. It's not a masterpiece, but it's head and shoulders above the usual schlock turned out by canon films. Ooh. Nathan <laughs> did not write that review. No, he did not. <laughs> uh, he says, what's to like? I think he might mean what's not to like. Because he follows it up with, 
Dolph Lundgren looks awesome as He-Man. Granted, his performance was a little wooden, mm. but when he raises a sword and yells, I have the power, all is forgiven. No, it's not. No, it's not. It was fucking shoehorned in. It was terrible. I thought he was going to say, when he says, uh, I have the power, I was wet. <laughs> <laughs> and I came. <laughs> and I'm done. Uh, this one it says, uh, ha ha ha, this movie was terrible. It was boring, but excellent for a kid's film. One star. Ooh, no, it was not. And also, I do- I'm really confused about that rating. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's an excellent kids movie, which, of course, as you know, means one star as a regular movie. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think Martin R. here, uh, he's at the same rating anyways, okay. one star. But his his review is concise and fairly accurate. I'm pretty sure this was bad when it came out. Now it's just shit. <laughs> <laughs> Josh K. <laughs> right. Uh, this is, okay, so this is a weird one, because I love these reviews that give, like, a weird rating at the end. The human characters are thin, as is the story, but Masters of the Universe is a time capsule of weird, and it's ultimately enjoyable, at least on a B-movie level. 62%. Three stars. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, Tony C. took... Uh, he took umbrage to the lack of love this movie was being shown because he gave it five stars. Okay. And he writes, Screw the haters. This thing is great. Frank Langella is awesome. The effects look pretty good for a low-budget flick. The sets are brilliant, and there's plenty of action. It's fun and entertaining, as a He-Man movie should be. First of all, this was not low budget. $22 million in 1986 money. That's poorly used budget, but not low yeah, budget. Low production value. Yeah. Um, I'll just read one more here. And it's a four-star review, and it simply says, Dolph Lundgren for president. <laughs> to which I say... Be careful, please. He he can't be elected. He wasn't born in America. True, but I'm just saying let's let's not throw that around anymore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's just. I let's think just... that that sums it up. I've got no reviews after that. Okay. <laughs> Presidential endorsement. Well, masters of the universe. All right. So let's uh, let's talk about next week real briefly here because uh, listeners' choice concludes next week. With uh, 1991's Steven Spielberg movie, which I never thought I would say his name on this podcast, uh, Hook, starring, of course, Robin Williams and Dustin Hoffman. And uh, yeah, that'll be interesting. We have some yep. stuff to say. We do. As, and that is, of course, presented to us by Mario of the Superiority Complex, and you'll hear why next week as well. Sure. But as for uh, that, that is wrapped up. That is under the bridge. I don't know. It's in the can. Thanks. It's in the can. Just like this movie should have never been in. <laughs> or unless you're talking about like a trash can. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, Steve is gonna hate us after this episode. Okay. This is like what one is... of his favorite movies. <laughs> now let's get to uh Montrose. Is he around? Yes. Yes he is. Alright, bring him on out. Hello! Hi! It's a good friend. Oh, yes, hello, Brendan. You don't interrupt me. Oh, sorry. I, I just I wanted to say hi back. Yeah, well, well, yeah, well, hello. Now, stop it. Sorry. Hello! Hi! It's, stop oh, it! Sorry, well, you keep saying hello to me. Well, just put, put, put me on mute in your earphones for just a moment. Okay. Okay. Hello! It's your good friend Montrose Monkington the Third here. And yes, I, I'm I'm back and wide awake this time, not like the last time when I was obviously woken in the middle of the night. Uh, I'm just here to say, uh, uh, please do uh, come see my uh, YouTube channel, Montrose Monkington TV. Uh, you can also be friends with me on Facebook uh, at Montrose Monkington the Third Esquire and friends. And you may also follow me on Twitter at Montrose the Third. That's the number three R D. And you can hit me up with the tweets, as the kids say. Uh, thank you. More later. 
Thank you, Montrose. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. So anyway, uh, you can uh, also find our podcast on all the social media places. That's what they're called. On Twitter and Instagram <laughs> at WWTT Podcast. And you can search for us on Facebook. Just search What Were They Thinking. We also have a Facebook group, What Were They Thinking Interactive. You can find us on Patreon. You can find us on Redbubble, on TeePublic. Anywhere you can find things, we're there. We probably have a RedTube account, too. I'm not sure. Should you tell uh, them they'll know. Oh, sorry. We don't advertise that? Oh. I'm trying to get it made into a premium channel, Nathan. Well, if you keep using Mariah's genitalia. <laughs> yeah, we're already... The subscriber count has skyrocketed. <laughs> uh, so... Yeah, and also you can find us, obviously, you're listening to this uh, show right now, but you can find us on Podbean at www.ttpodcast.podbean.com. That's our home. But you can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and all that good stuff. But, Nathan, I do yes. have to wonder because you, uh, you know, we talked about this movie and you seem mm -hmm. to have a few questions. Well, I did. Um,. And I guess I got the more pressing ones. Yes. I mean, when you have a plethora of source material, mm -hmm. uh, seasons upon seasons of episodes of a beloved cartoon, yes. character models, uh, set models to work with, all, all at, at least a few two-part episodes that could have easily been made into a movie two pre-existing movies one of which actually saw the inside of a theater and then you turn around and you make a turd like this mm -hmm. i just i gotta know canon films what were they thinking Was A Quiet Place inspired by signs it comes at night in War for the Planet of the Apes? Was Ready Player One influenced by Avatar, Wreck-It Ralph, and The Last Starfighter? Is the Hurricane Heist more influenced by Sharknado or Geostorm? These are the kinds of questions my guest co-hosts and I discuss on my podcast, Piecing It Together. Every week we look at a new movie and try to figure out what other movies inspired it, whether it's the story, the character development, tone, or even use of music. Every movie was influenced by something that came before it, and we want to figure out what. Check out Piecing It Together on your favorite podcast app or check us out on piecingpod.com. You can also follow us on social media at piecingpod. Piecing It Together is a part of the All Points West Podcast Network. Hi, I'm Jay Batts. And I'm Michael. And we're the hosts of a very thought-provoking show called The What If Podcast. On it, we'll explore the big and little what ifs of life and steer our listeners toward a better understanding of the real or hypothetical situations we might find ourselves in. Or not. On our journey, we'll learn interesting facts and fictions about the everyday world. And sometimes, most of the times, we'll dive headlong into rabbit holes that slide up against the subject and sharply turn away from it. Come along with us. We'll have fun and learn something new together. New episodes release every other Tuesday. Find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Music, and anywhere fine podcasts are archived.